everyone, welcome back to a CI Chit Chat. Mitchell Hora here with you, and uh, I've got a special guest, Terry. Uh, Terry Gleaves is on here today as well. I'll get over to him in just a minute. Um, but uh, we'll start things off as always. Um, this is a CI Chit Chat talking about carbon intensity. I can tell you, Matt, we've got a whole bunch of different uh, tools that we're offering there, helping farmers get their carbon intensity scores for their crops and getting all that verified and helping to manage all this data. Um, and it's important because we got 45Z tax credit. It's supposed to start January 1. I highly doubt that we are going to get the rules by December 31st, which is what the law says. But I still am confident that we will get some rules before inauguration and before a change in Washington, D.C. So uh, maybe I uh, double tap into that here for just a second. Um, variety of conversations that we are having um, with folks at, at USDA and just watching stuff online and other folks who are um, tied in with the White House one not talking about the progress that is being made when it comes to creating some of these rules. So a couple things there. One, this is a tax credit. So ultimately, the rule comes from the Department of Treasury. It comes from the IRS. So they get the final say-so. Um, and of course, Department of Treasury, um, Secretary of Treasury is in an appointed position. Um, as we know, there's going to be a lot of change over there. Um, this new guy coming in to take that role is a guy by the name of Scott Bassett. Um, I think I said that right. Um, but he uh, coming in, especially from the investment side of things and um from his past, he's not super gung ho on um, biofuels and these and green stuff and these type of tax credits. But uh, we'll see. Especially with forty five Z, it's got very good bipartisan support, and I think we'll still be able to, to work with these guys. But we'll find out. <clears throat> and then the U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Ag, has been helping, and they are definitely creating some rules as well. And we know that one of the rules that they're trying to put out by inauguration is a rule about quantifying the carbon intensity of biofuel feedstocks. So it's literally exactly what we're talking about here. The holdup is that USDA is saying they want to put out a rule about carbon intensity and biofuel feedstocks, but to have it be more all-encompassing and a little bit more open um, versus only have it centered around 45C. So... I think that's maybe a little bit of a holdup is they're trying to think more holistically outside of just corn, soybeans, main biofuel crops, try to think more holistically and trying to put together rules that uh, are going to be broader in scope, but we'll see what they, we'll see what they come up with. The stuff that I'm hearing, you know, is that they'll have a rule kind of put together that um, will be a preliminary rule. It's if we're not going to be a hundred percent, um, you know, set in concrete by any means. Um, but I think that's still a good thing. Get the initial rules out there, allow for public comment to start occurring, allow for conversations and feedback to really ramp up and happen. Then you've got a new administration coming in who can ingest all those comments, can work off of them and develop rules faster. The alternative being nothing gets done between now and inauguration. Trump's people come in and they start from scratch and the whole thing is just delayed even further than what it already is. So hopefully they do get um, some stuff done and keep making progress there. So we're definitely pushing them, that's for sure, and uh, offering our help however they, however they want. So um, I think that's the main stuff I wanted to start with here. Why don't, uh, if we can, Terry, do we, uh, we got you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? We got you, Terry. <laughs> Terry Gleaves is with us here today. Okay. Terry, um, you've been, you know, uh, we've been um, hanging out and running in the same circles for a number of years here now and excited to get you on here today. But why don't, why don't we just start with Terry? Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your farm. You got some stuff off the farm as well, but uh, give yourself a little introduction and we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, um, Terry Gleaves. I am in southwest Iowa, Pottawatomie County, on the east side of Pot County. Um, and my oldest son, Evan, uh, farm 1,500 acres, a row crop, uh, run 90 head of cow-calf pairs. 
and uh, I've I've been cover cropping everything, all eight crop acres for the last two years. I originally started cover cropping on the first field would be 15 years ago. I uh, started working with covers a little bit, experimenting. Um, number one, maybe was to try the thing around here was to try and uh, to cure ditches or gullies, erosion problems. And it worked well there. And like, why am I just doing a little bit of a field? Let's do whole fields. And my goal was from that day forward to increase my acres every year of the covers. And I really uh, have liked the system and have gotten to the point where I cover everything now. And I do plant all my crops green into living cover and then the corn I I kill as soon as possible after it's planted. Uh, yeah. Beans are a couple weeks anyway after planted before I kill them. That's awesome. But it has worked well for me. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, we've similar experience, right? And being able to uh, get it ramped up across every acre and be able to make it work agronomically while getting some of these soil health gains, erosion control all that good stuff. And and, it's, and I think on your farm too, you've been seeing uh, seeing some of those soil health gains and whatnot, but especially when you're talking here about data and about telling our story and being utilizing that story to help other people meet their goals, whether that be government meeting their goals or co helping companies to meet their goals, utilizing our data, uh, we've got a role to play. Have you participated in any of those type of uh, programs, whether it be um, government stuff or um, private sector sustainability programs or carbon stuff where you've been able to leverage this story and the uh, practices that you've been doing on your farm? I have not joined any of the carbon programs. No, I've looked at a lot of them. Um, I guess I was more worried about finding the right fit and I didn't want to join something that I couldn't get out of because the main goal I think was in the last few years with this uh, 45Z coming forward with your knowledge uh, targeting that as a great fit for what I do. Um, within I also I am the district conservationist in East Pot County so I work for NRCS full time. And I've worked a lot with the state soil health people on uh, bringing people to my farm and letting them dig and do the soil health tests and teaching other employees uh, how important it is. And um, it's really, really neat when you see the pictures of the soil structure now from what it was. Uh, we talk about it all the time, and when you go out there and actually do it and see it, yeah. and the smell and, and texture and everything, it's just uh, something that I really believe in. It's really been good for me. That's awesome. I'm I'm in the same boat, right? Where we started, especially with Continuum Ag, right? Started it <clears throat> focus around soil health, soil health and analysis, especially with the Haney test, and helping farmers implement these practices. And that's super important. I love doing that stuff, right? And we've seen the same thing on our farm over now. Uh, you know, we're more than 10 years into cover cropping and a uh, long, long time no-till and really seeing those changes occur. Just like you're saying, the texture, the color, yep. the life that you can just see physically in the soil, like it actually is working. And that's what led us, you know, to trying to figure out how do we get more farmers go in this direction right how do we get more farmers to understand that we do need to mimic mother nature we need to follow the soil health principles and over you know i've been monitoring some of these carbon programs sustainability stuff really since 2019 get involved in it and all these programs they were fine but they they weren't getting a lot of enrollment they weren't getting a lot of interest and there's a lot of concern when it came to the juice now being worth the squeeze the money wasn't that good for the the long-term contracts and what are you signing up for if it's a five or a 10 year kind of thing that could be really scary and there's a lot of unknowns in ag uh, especially when you're talking the time frame of five or 10 years or even more 
then there's so many companies that are in that space. Like, who do you trust and who do you want to work with? Especially if you are signing long term contracts. And, and uh, yeah, for the most part, we've just stayed away from them for years and years. Now we've been <clears throat> moving forward and doing some carbon insetting because they don't have the long term contracts and um, the, the money's a little bit better for the ask. Um, but especially with carbon intensity, that's why I love it so much is it avoids all that. Like there's an opportunity now that this could be really good money, way better than any of these private cost share, private, uh, uh, carbon programs, better money, easier on the, on the lift. It's a lot of data for sure, but it's not multiple years. It's not, uh, it's not overly invasive and, um, and there's no long-term contracts. It's you create the certificates every year, sell them, done, and you get choice to get to choose. But then I think also Terry, what's important too is that the CI stuff it actually allows for early adopters like you and and farms like mine that we can act and tell our story. Too. I think the the stars kind of seem to be aligning to an extent to level the playing field, let everybody be able to participate. And everybody be able to get compensated based on how far they want to push their practices. Has that kind of been your take on it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, I get why they're feeling like they need to try and open it up a little bigger, wider to reach more farmers. But it's up to the farmer, you know, it's his system, what he's doing. And if he's not uh, doing a lot of it, just doing a few cover crops here and there to try and get a decent score and to cash in a little bit, that's his choice. But I'm not sure that's really what they're after in this deal. Yeah, they want a lot, right? But what I like about it is a farmer can still start with, all right, let's let's do kind of baby step into it because... Uh, I've got right horror stories. I think you got some too, right? Of of how we've screwed this up over time as well. But what I like is it's not all or nothing, which is kind of like what the 40B rules were. That's where you had to do the bundle of practices of cover crops, no-till, and stabilizers, and it was all or nothing. And it would really force people to uh, potentially make some major changes all at one time versus going with a carbon intensity score using the greet model the farmer can adopt the practices at their own pace and yeah that we want them to of course go further faster you and i being soil health guys i think they get there over time though because now the carrot is finally big enough that it really incentivizes folks coming to the table and we're definitely seeing that i don't know are you seeing um some of the the practice adoption picking up in your neck of the woods out there in western iowa or or staying about the same yeah, I definitely think uh, we're starting to see a little more here. Um, one reason we've got, you know, uh, some of these other companies coming in and and pushing guys to do it for the payment. So they're willing to try some cover crops if they haven't done them before, you know, to get some money. And then, then if they try it, then they're like, well, maybe I ought to see if I can... Uh, do a little more and plan on this for five years or whatever, you know, and, and I think our cover crop contracts are up this last year because people are seeing that uh, overall in this area. You mean your cover crop contract stuff with your NR, putting your NRCS hat on? Yes. And people yes. utilizing the, the, especially utilizing the Iowa cost share program is what I'm assuming you're talking about, right? Right. That's right. Now, yeah, I think Iowa. There's so many of those that they can't they can't do both, so they have to make a choice. But um, NRCS has really good cost share monies right now. If they're not sure, they want want to buy in with the uh, with the program that whoever is offering. So they go that way until they figure it out more, you know, and and it's it helped them that way. Agreed. And, and uh, I like the IDALS program for through our Iowa Department of Ag that it pays pretty good money. And at least in, in my experience over here and utilizing the program in Washington County, I fill out a, a piece of paper with my contact information and how many acres I want to apply for. 
the uh, the county uh, soil commissioners uh, helped to kind of divvy up the funds and say, okay, who are we going to be able to have funding for? They send a letter back saying, hey, you're you've made the cut. You're on the list. Um, you know, it's it's a first in, you know, first come, first serve kind of thing. And then uh, after I apply the cover crop, I just go back in the office and say, here's my receipt. Here's where I put the cover crop. Here's how many acres that ended up being. They say, cool. Uh, and they do spot checks and stuff, but then they, they mail a check. And um, really simple process that doesn't take hardly any time at all. Um, some of the paperwork can now be done just digitally or through DocuSigns and stuff as well, which makes it even easier. And, um, and I think that's why it's been so successful is it's not an overly cumbersome process to be able to tap into this this Iowa program. And hopefully other states are picking up on that as well. Um, you know, in, in comparison to like EQIP or CSP, some of the federal programs that the paperwork can be a big, big lift. Um, but I, I right. Way, Terry, I don't know what your thoughts are uh, on. I think the IDALS one is as successful as it is because they've simplified it as much as possible. Yes, definitely. And, and they increased their cost share this year. So, yeah. I mean, that's helping too. What is it at for uh, for maybe folks who are new and stuff? Is it new cover crop? It's 20, bu- 20 bucks now. First year is. 30 i believe for first year guys and then after that it is 20 bucks yeah for the remainder they want to re-sign up every year yeah it used to be 25 bucks your first year 15 bucks an acre for subsequent years after that it's still capped at 160 acres though right yes 160 acres per entity or per applicant is the most you can get it out right is is uh you don't have just um large farms should gobbling up all the acres and in a county there they try to spread it out by capping the number that you can get but yeah i think it's been a really good thing and and then what i like too is okay you've got that private cost share and now there's there's new money coming in or that there's that public cost share but now there's new additional programs and money coming in that should be able to stack with that and be able to utilize both programs here um and making things hopefully also simple straightforward easy uh easy going for everyone to be able to participate there but i don't know we'll we'll see what's your take terry specifically on how you guys are approaching uh 45z and what are you thinking about you know for your last year's crop or the crop you've already harvested and how you're going about marketing or how you're going about uh any conversation with your local ethanol plant and stuff going on for 2024 and then you know any outlook on 2025 yeah, well, we had forward contracted a little bit, which we knew we couldn't hold in bins uh, for delivery during harvest, uh, but not a lot. And we've kind of just put it in the bin and locked the door and yeah. kind of waiting on the market to react here a little bit, hopefully. Um, but overall... Um, with the year we had, we had a lot of storms over here this year, hit and miss. Uh, you know, we had Minden, Iowa is not very far from me. They had the tornado rip up the town. Um, so we, like we had one farm that had a lot of green snap. There was a lot of it in the area and that farm really took a hit because of that. Um, but overall, um, I've heard some really good yields hit and miss around and I've heard kind of the norm, uh, maybe an average of 200 this year, which is a little disappointing from, from what we've had the last few years, we've been 225 to 240 for like five years in a row. So, um, I think it was probably a combination of, storms decreasing your population throughout the year and then the late heat i think the heat really pulled back uh some bushels in the end hot and dry at the end yeah yeah i mean over overall you know the quality of our grain was good the the ears were filled out there wasn't any tip back you know, so it's somewhat surprising when we got in there and it's a little less than what we thought it would be. But um, 
at least we had something. You know, there's guys that had a lot of the green snaps that took a 50 bushel hit just right now from that. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I guess because of the markets, I like my cover crops, I did some things a little different. I put in 50 acres of wheat that if the bean price doesn't improve, I'm probably going to take that to harvest this next summer. I I planted 150 acres of triticale that I'm going to hopefully uh, put up some of that for cow feed just to take advantage of it. Sure. And overall, I mean, uh, last spring after I preg checked cows, I split them up in three groups and put them on three different pieces of ground and, and I did not feed hay uh, the rest of the year to those cows. And they actually put on quite a bit of weight and calved them on that rye. And it just, it works so well that way. Yeah, that's awesome. And you got, the, you know, you got the cows out there that long. I, I really believe that the cattle aspect, you know, of running on those fields uh, is the last part of the soil health complex that, that people can take advantage of. Yeah, it's mimicking Mother Nature. It's is what it's all about, right? Getting the livestock back That's out right. in the buffalo, mimicking the natural prairie system, and depositing all that uh, manure and stuff right back out there. Uh, we yeah. were talking with their, uh, had meeting with our third party verifiers yesterday, and trying to figure out how do we account for that. You know, when uh, manure is part of all these programs and stuff, but how do you account for the animals depositing the manure themselves? Of course, you don't have an application map. You don't have records of exactly how much was applied. So how do we account for right. that? <laughs> That's one, yeah. of the, one of the rabbit holes we kind of uh, started going down yesterday. We'll figure out exactly how to go about that, but it will be able to to uh, be be counted is what it sounds like. So, um, but yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions about how do we market grain? And how should we go about it? And I think you did it right, right? Of You're holding on to as much as we kind of can, selling what you need to sell. Um, and, and if guys need cash, if you want to, if you've got, you know, delivery that needs to be made, go ahead and do it. One of the biggest things that is still unknown with the 45Z rules is how is the data going to be traded? And there's really two kind of main routes that it can go. One, uh, which is what we're, we're pushing for, is that it would be done with a book and claim where your data, your certificates that you create, one certificate per bushel, the certificates can be sold to any biofuel producer and the grain can be sold separately, kind of like a carbon credit. Deliver the grain wherever you want to deliver the grain, sell the, the CI certificates separately and get paid for that data and for that certificate like a carbon credit. Alternative is you sell the data and the grain together. So you have to basically deliver your grain to a, an ethanol plant or a biofuel producer, or you have to deliver it to an elevator who then is going to be buying that data and then they are going to resell it to a biofuel producer um, and, of course, get um, get compensated for doing so. And uh, But in us attempting to track this all the way through the supply chain or do it with a mass plant where your data is just kind of weighted average, blended in with everyone else's, and it just kind of lowers the the opportunity um that's an alternative to doing the book and claim but hopefully it ends up being book and claim because i believe what would happen there is that the grain that you already sold um you'd still be able you still have the CI certificate so you haven't sold the data you haven't sold the certificates you would still have that available that that could be sold uh into the 45z market so even on some of that grain that was already delivered now again we don't know the rules but it's my understanding that if we do get a book and claim that's how it uh, likely would work out is that even on the grain you've already sold, but you still created those certificates on this crop year and you could sell those certificates um, after the the new year once we get the rules. So hopefully that'll be uh, the way that it ends up being for you, Terry, and get you uh, potentially get you compensated there for the practices that you did for that crop year 2024. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping anyway. We're gonna find out here real soon. Is the is the hope, Terry? What do you uh, maybe uh, other thoughts or or what do you 
talking to farmers about or any message here we're already running out of time um message that uh, your take on some of these programs or your message to farmers as they're thinking about 45z or these other programs or just health practices in general yeah uh, i'm actually getting a lot of that um guys are signing up for some different things um i just some of them have already signed and come and told me, you know, well, this is this is how it's going to affect you, you know, and, and they're okay with that. Some of them are annual contracts, so they can get out of it each year if they want to choose to go a different direction. Which that's helpful. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of different people around talking to farmers, uh, trying to get in on action now. It's increasing as we speak, I believe. This this fall, it seems to be a couple more different entities coming into play that are trying to get involved. So um, it's a big, big deal for guys. I just tell them to be cautious and make sure, you know, they're comfortable with their decision because it will affect what else they do going down the road once it's 45Z is in place if that was their main goal or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, sometimes sign your name on the dotted line. You've got to, yeah, you got to sleep in the bed you've made once in a while too. And you might end up leaving money right. or you might end up of, of making the wrong decision and you got to be able to live with that. Um, but I think you're right in encouraging folks, make sure that the contracts that you, if you are signed up a contract for some type of a carbon program, make sure you understand uh, the length of the term, make sure you understand how to get out of the contract if you need to get out of it or if you need to change things up uh, to make sure you have flexibility or as much flexibility as possible. Because it uh, keeps changing. There's a lot of dust that still has to settle here. And um, hopefully we keep getting more clarity over the coming 50 days between now and inauguration. But um, we're going to be we're going to be monitoring it closely. So and we'll keep sharing it here. Um, on these chit chats and sharing our perspective and trying to get other folks to perspective. Terry, I think you, I think you're thinking about the right way. And um, it all does boil down to, of course, those soil health principles and that's the tried and true. Right. And I think that's my uh, final thought here for today is uh, yeah, we're, we're chasing some of these programs, chasing some of this money. And um, I, I think we got to take opportunity where we can, where we can get it. But at the end of the day, those programs and stuff, the, the chase of the money, it's going to continue to be a moving target. The goalposts are going to change. Programs are going to come and go. Dollar amounts are going to change. It's going to be a, an ongoing battle year over year over year. What's consistent is the soil health principles. And that's what we can control. We can continue to control our agronomy. We can continue to control how we are implementing the principles, how we are working to build soil health, and through building soil health, building in resiliency into our soils, resilience into our finances, resilience against mother nature and whatever she's going to throw at us from a weather perspective year over year and uh, and try to capitalize on whatever the, the program is at that time. But the soil health principles is really what this boils down to. And I just see this as the best opportunity to get more folks to understand that and bring more folks to uh, onto that soil health journey. And because um, that's, that's really where the long-term family farm profitability is going to come from. So, uh, okay, well, we'll have a, another chit chat here. And we're not doing one next week, um, but the week after is our 50th episode. And uh, I don't know if we've announced it yet, but we'll give you all a sneak preview here. We've got uh, the millennial farmer is joining me for episode number 50. Uh, my buddy, Zach Johnson, Zach and I have done a bunch of podcasts together in the past, but it's been a while. So we got Tim coming on for the 50th episode um, should be a really good time. That'll be December 17th, Tuesday morning, same time, just like normal. But uh, Terry, it's been great to have you on here today as well. And uh, hopefully you stay warm out there in Western Iowa today um, and, and have a great rest of the year and, and into the Christmas season and, and now into uh, what will hopefully be an even, maybe we'll get you guys back to your amazing yields that you've had over the last five years out there. In West Nile, get you some of that back here in 2025. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, thank you, Mitchell, for the opportunity to be on here, and and it's great talking to you. Always, always a pleasure, Terry. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. 
see you next time.